everybody. I'm back with uh, John Pennant. John Pennant is a, a partner at Eisner Ampner. It's one of the largest accounting firms in the U.S. They provide audit tax, business advisory services. And John um, leads the technology and life science area. And I know John has seen a lot of companies, a lot of entrepreneurs in his time. So he knows of what he is talking about uh, when he goes through uh, what he's going to be walking through right now. So so, John, thanks for your time again today, and we look forward to it. hearing from you. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today uh, on behalf of uh, my colleagues at Eisner Amper. We have uh, over 2,000 employees. Um, our, our technology and life sciences group is one of our pillar industry groups. Uh, I'm proud to represent that group there and lead that practice. Uh, and as Jeff mentioned, uh, you know, we're a pretty significant sized accounting firm. We have over 200 partners deal with a lot of public companies. Um, and, and the technology group in particular, we deal with companies from the embryonic stage of uh, just getting started all the way through their growth and development, and then up to their public company status, going through their IPOs, SPAC transactions, whatever they may be. So uh, one of the things I enjoy most is the entrepreneurial journey. Um, and also, just as an FYI, I, I'm also a, a member of the Mid-Atlantic BioAngels, which is an angel network, and I'm a small angel investor as well. So I'll be giving you my perspectives, both from the perspective of a professional service provider who works with entrepreneurs, and also as an investor. Okay. So as Jeff mentioned, and I'll just take a quick moment here just to mention, and you can see on the screen here, some of the services that we at Eisner Amper offer. So accounting and auditing, we do outsourced accounting in particular for early stage companies, uh, taxation often with respect to the, not only the company, but also the entrepreneurs. Um, and then advisory side in terms of benchmarking, um, compensation programs, et cetera, et cetera. So full service, we're able to help um, entrepreneurial companies from sort of start to finish. Okay. So, why is this presentation important? So I think what we want to talk a little bit about here today is that you know, starting a company is really hard work. 90% um, of, of startup companies fail, and often they fail very quickly. So one of the reasons why companies fail is that they just run out of capital. So having a clear idea of what your capital needs are and being able to accomplish enough fundraising to, to move into the next level of your company, really important. And we also have to keep in mind that, you know, raising money is a, it is a competitive landscape. Uh, there are lots of people who are entrepreneurs. I think there are many more people who would rather be an entrepreneur than to have my job as a partner in an accounting firm. So it's much more interesting, I believe, and, and more, more people are thinking about entrepreneurship as their course forward. So it's very competitive to think about how do I differentiate myself? How do I get the attention of, of the venture capitalist, of angel investors as a way to get the capital that I need to develop the business? Okay. So when you do get the opportunity to come up with your idea and you start to think about raising that capital, you need to really be well prepared. And we're going to talk a little bit about that during our course in our session today. So one of the one of the tenants that most investors think about is you have to have a product that's meeting a need. Okay. You want to figure out how to grow that in grow that company, grow that idea. And if you're going to fail, let's fail fast. So we don't raise, don't waste too much money and don't waste too much time and then move on to the next step, the next, the next idea. So you wanna go through that process of really doing the ideation fairly quickly. And if it's gonna work, it's gonna work. So we're gonna to talk today a little bit about some of the things that, that an investor might look for in going through diligence and being ready to speak with that investor. So what is, it, what is the venture capitalist looking for in an investment opportunity? And really the same thing applies to an angel investor or really any investor. So team and TAM, that's, that, that's always the two most important things. So without the team that the investor has confidence in, then there really can be no path forward. I'm sorry about that. Um, 
there can really be no path forward. So even if you've got a brilliant idea and there's a huge marketplace, if an investor doesn't have confidence that your team can execute against that, then they can't invest in you. So creation of that team is really important. For first time entrepreneurs, obviously very hard. You don't have the track record. So how do I get the track record? Um, so you can associate yourself with other members uh, of your, you know, develop your team who have been there and done that before. You can take on advisors, you can take on mentors. Um, you can pay them with some stock and some ownership of the company. You can do some deferred compensation and, and other ways to really help build your team out uh, and to fill in gaps that maybe are not your strong point. So if you're heavy on the science side, you find somebody to help you on the business side or vice versa. So you build out your team and your resources. The second part of that is TAM, the total addressable market. So obviously a large growing market, a chance to really disrupt um, something that's not gonna be slightly incremental better than the last mousetrap, but something that is a really different way of looking at it. Um, so I think those are the types of things that, that a, a, a VC would look at. Um, ideally, once you get to the venture capital level, you've gone through some, some ideation, you've maybe even gone through some pilots and some, some test cases, and you've gotten some level of market feedback. Um, that's always important when you're dealing with the, with the venture capital investment, um, that, there's a, that there's an idea that there is a marketplace and there is people who will buy your product, okay? So you, you wanna think about it from their perspective a little bit. And, and here we're gonna talk for a second about uh, what, what the economics look like. So investors like to, you know, the fear of missing out is a big topic for investors. You know, they don't wanna miss out on a big market opportunity or a big company deal. Um, so what are they looking for here? So this slide here has some statistics here, which we're not gonna go through these in all, the, in all these details, but there's a big difference between asking your rich uncle Joe for some seed capital to start a business with the expectation that you're gonna pay him back someday and everything will be fine and your rich uncle is happy to help uh, get you started on your business. That's perfectly fine. Um, but that is not what a professional investor is looking for. They don't wanna be paid back over time. They wanna make a superior return. So 7X invested capital within seven years, that's a significant uh, rate of return. Um, so they're looking for opportunities where there's gonna be a huge opportunity to sell the company, to do some sort of an out license, whatever the metric may be down the road, but to get a superior return. And I'll just give you one other um, tidbit of information from a venture capitalist perspective. If you look at the metrics of a venture capital's um, rate of return over time, what you'll see is that the batting average is only about 33%, which means that the bulk of their funds return and the money going back to the investors in the venture capital fund is coming from a third of the investments. So those investments have to be big opportunities to provide that sort of return to cover for the fact that the other two thirds were either break even or losses. So they want big opportunities, big opportunities for return. So a couple of things to think about before you start to think about fundraising, okay? So you wanna raise the amount of capital that you need, not necessarily the amount that you want. So in order to do that, you have to have a really clear and concise um, delineation of what your capital deployment timeline looks like and how much money do you need to get to the me next major milestone. So you want to have enough money to make sure you get to that milestone. Um, that's going to significantly improve your valuation and the likelihood of success. So you really need to calculate very quickly and very precisely how much money is it going to take to get there. Okay. So one of the things that is involved in figuring out that cost is the cost of getting great talent. So we talked a little bit about your team um, earlier, but getting the right people involved in the company, getting them on board, getting the paperwork signed, um, getting them ownership if they need to be a, like at a partner level with you, 
uh, getting them stock options, whatever that might be, and get that, get that paperwork done and signed as early as you can. It builds commitment, it builds consistency, can save you a lot of money in potential and taxation and accounting issues down the road. Um, but most importantly is build that into your budget. So it takes time to recruit the right people. It takes money to pay them the right amount of money to keep them highly motivated and, and rowing in the same direction. So build that into your budget, okay? And, and again, just to kind of re reiterate from the perspective of the um, of, of, of the capital that you raise is you think about key milestones that you need to reach over the course of time um, and build into your budgets. What are those key milestones and make sure you raise enough money to reach each of those milestones. So maybe you raise $2 million to get to a prototype. You raise $4 million to get to a soft launch. You raise $6 million to get to a nationwide launch. Whatever those numbers may be, you want to clearly be able to delineate that, raise that amount of money, and accomplish that objective. At the very early stage, when you really don't have anything um, accomplished yet, when you're just starting the business, one of the things you can do as you have conversations with potential investors is you talk about the things that you need to do. And then when you have a chance to meet them again down the road, when you're ready for the next round of discussion talks about investments, you talk about that you've accomplished those objectives. So have clear objectives, accomplish them, check them off the list. You're de-risking the investor as you go. So one of the things that I hear sometimes from my angel perspective is when we talk to entrepreneurs and we ask about their competition, if the entrepreneur comes back and says, we have no competition, then the conversation is almost always over at that point in time. Um, there is always competition. It may not be in your particular field. They may be coming at, be coming at it from an entirely different angle, um, but there's always competition. And, and you as the entrepreneur need to have an awareness of what those competitions are. Um, you need to know what other people are doing, how they're attacking the same problem you are from different vantage points and how to, how to um, respond to how far ahead or behind that competition is. Okay. So from the financial considerations perspective, we talked a little bit about that you should have these organized milestones. So really think carefully about the steps that you need, uh, whether you need to spend money on IP, on engineers, um, on market research, on product design and development. Uh, all of those aspects should be, you should itemize each one of those, come up with a time frame that's both time-based and dollar-based to the best that you can, that you, the best that you can do that. You get estimates from vendors and contractors for those various things. So if you need to do a market research study or you need to do a product design, um, talk to some vendors, get some ideas at least. So this is gonna be between 25,000 and 50,000. This is gonna be uh, somewhere between 100 and $500 to build, whatever it is, have some ideas and some support as you put together that milestones and the budgets along with that. Uh, obviously, all entrepreneurs really need to understand their monthly cash burn. You know, cash is precious in this capital markets where funding is, is a little bit tougher right now that the, with the public markets being in a little bit of uh, turmoil right now. Um, cash is king. So really understand what your cash burn is. Um, be as judicious as you can with the spending of it. Um, and even more importantly, be as judicious as you can in making commitments to spend cash. Um, most, most vendors understand working with early stage companies that there will be times where uh, it may take a little time to get paid. Um, you should be clear in those conversations up front, um, but don't take on more than you can reasonably pay. Okay. You'll often see that various vendors, for an example, so certain um, IP attorneys will do deferred billing until you get a certain amount of funding and things like that. So there's different ways you can help to manage that cash flow. And then here in, the, in when you eventually, when you put together your deal room, you know, you want to have some of this information um, at your ready fingertips so that if, if asked, you have, you have the information together. 
So your historical financial statements, you keep your books on QuickBooks or something like that. Uh, your projections with your balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow, with some of the with some of the support behind it. So as you're thinking about how you're going to enter the market, you, you have your your projections in terms of your pricing and your market penetration and the quantity of units you're going to sell, etc. So you want to have your support for those projections as part of your deal room and documented as part of your projections. It brings a lot of credibility. Um, an investor is always going to challenge your projections. Um, they're going to probably look at it with a less rosy perspective than you are. But if you have your, your, your assumptions well laid out and documented, then at least you have a basis for conversation. So um, coming up with that in seven years, we'll have a billion dollars of revenue. And when you look at the uh, the balance sheet and the amount of cash that you have when, you know, in seven years, you're going to have, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of cash on hand. Um, again, that's sort of a non-starter, right? Because that's not reasonable. It's not realistic. Um, it doesn't show a, a credibility of thought in terms of what it's going to take to, to build that business. Those types of projections are exceptionally rare. Uh, most of them take much slower and cost much more money than you think. Okay. So you want to have command and control of your projections. So really understand it, know where the numbers come from, and feel comfortable and confident in your discussions about this. Okay. So when you do get a chance to have, have a conversation with an investor, you want to be diligence ready. So they're going to be conducting diligence on you. This, this uh, conversation here is more focused on uh, financial, but you know, obviously, uh, understanding your IP, your licenses, your patents, you know, whether you have university licenses, um, what rights and privileges do other people have with respect to your technology? What, what customer agreements or development partner agreements do you have in place? Um, well, again, what, uh, what, what are the expectations for the future? Your cap table. So who owns the company or who do you owe money to in the form of like debt if you took some loans from Uncle Joe or other investors? Um, having again, cl clarity on who owns the company, uh, what percentage they own, what type of security, preferred stock, stock options, et cetera. All your corporate governance documents, your articles of incorporation, your rights to do business in various states, countries, whatever it might be. Um, and then taxes. So um, for early stage companies, the financial diligence is uh, generally speaking more limited to the fact that are you a good corporate citizen? Are you paying your taxes? Are you paying your payroll taxes? Are you paying your sales taxes? Are you keeping books and records? Do your bank accounts and credit card accounts reconcile? They are not necessarily at the very early stage concerned about gap accounting but they will be very quickly as you start to scale and you start to get revenues and you start moving towards your series A and then your series B investment. So we talked a little bit about the market as well. So in preparing your diligence, it's really understanding the market that you are addressing with your product development, okay? So there's always an 800 pound gorilla in the room. Uh, they dominate the market with whatever their technology or service offering is. Um, you need to understand the pros and cons of that, what, work, what works well, uh, what doesn't work well, and why your solution is a differentiator from that well-established solution that's in the marketplace. Um, it helps to have some expectations of pricing. So compared to that 800-pound gorilla, how might you price your product? Uh, are you going to be a lower cost provider? Are you going to be a premium price provider because you're offering superior services? Um, important things to think about as you're setting those up. Um, and then understanding again, who your customer is going to be. So will you price this as a premium product? Will you price this as a volume product where you're going for lower cost? Um, and how are you addressing that need? All that goes into your product design and making sure you have a product market fit. Okay, so one of the questions that I'm often asked in my role as a professional service advisor and, and an accountant to many early stage companies is, how should I think about the value of my company when I'm speaking to investors? 
should I ask for a pre-money valuation of say $5 million or $2 million when I'm trying to raise one or two more million dollars? Um, at the very early stage, this is, this is an art, it is not a science. Um, sometimes we're asked if we can actually do a valuation report and, and provide a written report as evidence to an investor of what the company is worth. Um, I would almost, I always tell people, no, I don't want to do that because it doesn't, it's not worth the paper it's written on. And it's not worth the money you're paying to get that valuation report done. Um, you do need to understand what the market opportunity is. Um, you think about all the factors that go into the valuation, you know, the management team, the, the size of the market, how far along you are, the competitive analysis, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it's a negotiation. Um, so you do need to have some benchmarks. So you should research very carefully similar companies, similar size deals, um, and trying to raise the size of the funds that you're trying to raise. So if a similar company is also raising $2 million, uh, there's lots of publicly available research that you can go through to see what the valuations were that those companies were able to raise money at. And that helps you to at least frame the discussion. Um, oftentimes we'll ask the question as part of our angel group, what is your pre-money valuation? Um, sometimes companies don't want to um, give that information away until later on in, in due diligence and advanced discussions. Um, but that really is an important idea to talk about very early on. Uh, so if you're talking to an angel group and you say my pre-money valuation is $50 million, then the conversation is probably over. It's not an angel deal. Um, if you say my pre-money valuation is between you know, one to $4 million, then there's conversations that can be had. So you need to have enough idea and, and knowledge and comfort base to be able to keep the conversations moving forward. Um, and obviously, to the extent that you can de-risk some of these items here, like market opportunity and the, the progress that you've made in the competitive analysis, you've reduced the risk in the investment, and that obviously equates to a higher valuation. So those are all things to think about as you're going through the valuation um, process of, of thinking about how to have those conversations with your investors, potential investors. And then finally, I'm just going to finish up here with a with with a, I guess really the, the the key message here is is preparation. So you want to target relevant investors and partners for your conversation. So there's no point in talking to an underwriting firm and going to Citigroup or J.P. Morgan if you're trying to raise two million dollars. It's the wrong it's the wrong target. It's the wrong size. Um, find the people who are the right size. Understand the firm that you're talking to. So if you are able to secure a meeting, understand what the firm is invested in, understand what the person in particular that you're meeting with, what they've invested in, what stage, are they, are they really early stage investors at the angel level or series A? Are they more advanced growth equity investors? Do they shy away from international? Are they uh, very much in favor of international or particular industry groups or subgroups? Do a lot of research on the people that you're, that you're talking to. Um, obviously, you're going to prepare your pitch deck. Uh, it's got to be very, very professional, concise, very clear. Your objective is to get the investor to want to learn more about your company. So you don't need to put all of the information into the deck. You don't need 45 scientific slides. Uh, you don't need all your projections with all your detail in the, in the pitch deck, but you need to have it available. So you have that as appendix, you have it as available information you can bring out if necessary. Um, you wanna be well rehearsed in going through that. Anticipate the questions that they're going to ask you. Um, have, have a second person as part of your team that could augment your skill set. So again, if you're on more of the scientific or the design side, and maybe you wanna have your partner on the business side come with you so that you have a combination of skill sets that are able to answer the questions that may be asked. Again, the investors are going to ask about the team and the markets and the opportunities and the competition. You need to have all that information well rehearsed and have, have good answers for those questions. And then finally, the final thought is, you know, this process takes time. So oftentimes I'm asked if I can bring a company to our angel group 
uh, we need to raise money uh, in the next in the next three weeks or the next uh, two months. Um, it takes time. It takes time to, for the investor to understand your market, your solution, the cost to get to the market, the cost to eventually get to an exit, and to get confidence that your team can deliver against the plan. So you need to build this. You need to build your timelines well in advance, so that you have the opportunity to. Uh, have these conversations, uh, build these relationships over time, uh, and, and eventually be able to get to uh, hopefully a yes answer. Uh, remember, the investors are going through thousands, hundreds of opportunities. Um, you, want, you want to stand out, so you need to have the time to be able to put that together um, and, and, and build that relationship over time and stand out from the crowd. Okay. So that's the end of my prepared remarks. Um, again, uh, my name is John Pennett, uh, partner in charge of the technology and life sciences practice. That's obviously an old picture before the, the beard grew out. Um, so um, uh, hopefully that was helpful for the team to um, uh, and for the entrepreneurs to, to get some ideas about uh, having those conversations with investors. Um, so Jeff, if I don't know if there's any questions. Yeah. So, yeah, hi, uh, John. That was great. That was great. It was good to get some some real concrete points behind uh, everything that we discussed today. Seeing some really concrete in terms of of what to do and steps. I, I have a real quick question though. Just from watching Shark Tanks in the past, we've always seen the mass this question about well, who else has invested in this? You touched on this, and in this case, maybe Uncle Joe gave you know five hundred thousand dollars, and we gave him ten percent, and they'd be like, oh, like oh my god, right? So. How often or how does somebody evaluate that first investment, equity versus debt? Are they better off saying, Uncle Joe, I'll give you, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it in form of a loan and I'll give it back at that 10 percent, you know, as opposed to equity? How many mistakes are being made at this early stage and what advice do you give somebody that's looking for that kind of money? So ultimately, when the investor comes in, and let's say they're going to come in with, let's say, a $2 million round, um, they're going to dictate the terms. Um, so they're going to say, listen, you need to get rid of this debt. Um, you need to say that, you know, Uncle Joe is only going to own 5%. And they're going to, you know, kind of influence things a little bit there. Um, it's often easier to do a safe investment, which is the um, a security in advance of, of future equity. Uh, or a convertible note or a loan um, at the early stage of a company so you can avoid the question of what is the company worth. Um, so at the very early stage, um, not really sure what it's worth. It hasn't been proven. We've only done some pilots, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know whether it's worth $2 million or $5 million. Uh, by doing something that's going to go into a future equity round, you've deferred that decision down the road. Um, and there's not a tremendous expectation that this is going to be repaid as like a debt, like a mortgage. Uh, the expectation is that it will convert into equity when we do a priced round. Okay, great. John, thanks very much again. Really appreciate it. And uh, you, you've already given out the information on how to get in touch with you if anybody has, has, a, has a need to speak with you on, on one of their companies that's getting ready to be launched or something. But thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Sounds great. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me here. Our pleasure. Take care.